So may I invite Prof. Samir Chakrabarti to chair the session. Good morning. It's a privilege for me to chair a session in which the speaker is Prof. Max Creswell. I and many others of my age had their first lessons of modal logic from his book co-authored by uh, Hughes, G. Hughes, namely an introduction to modal logic which was published in 1968. I can well understand the <coughs> courage that was required to write a book on modal logic at that time when a strong reservation against uh, such logic was voiced by personality like uh, Quine. And I have heard that uh, there was some, uh, there was some um, uh, reluctance on the part of the publisher to, to uh, publish the book. However, modal logic has lived and living a very uh, uh, vigorous life. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't uh, um, uh, stay between you and Professor Creswell. I invite Professor Creswell to present his talk. Creswell, please. When a Adrian was invited to give an address at this conference, I thought, ah, I will be able to come along as an accompanying person. But uh, Kamal got to hear of the fact that I was coming, and I'm absolutely delighted to be invited here. We've, uh, we've all been entertained so lavishly, the organization of the conference, and those of us who have had to organize these things before know how, how difficult it is, and we're all, I know, very, 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 very grateful uh, for that. Listening to the papers at the TARC conference and this conference, one of the things that came home to me was that modal logic was much, much easier 50 years ago, or even 45 years ago. And so I'm going to talk about what modal logic was like uh, a decade before the development of the possible world semantics. I'm going to look at some early work, work by Rudolf Carnap in 1946, published in 1946 in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, and a paper by J.C.C. McKinsey, published in 1945 in the Journal of uh, Symbolic Logic. Now, you will have been given, I hope, two handouts. One is a one sheet of paper with just the sort of summary, and the other is the full paper, which Kamal has very kindly uh, reproduced uh, for us. The paper is going to be published in the Proceedings of the Asian Logic Conference held in Wellington at the end of 2011, so it's not in the Proceedings of this conference, but that paper you have there. So you, you will, I will be talking mostly to the handout, and the point of the handout, you don't actually have to read it until I tell you to. If I, if I, it, it has things that, that save me the trouble of writing uh, on the blackboard. The handout begins with a couple of quotations from Carnap, whose point was to try to develop a modal logic without any metaphysics. And that was, that was one of his aims. In that aim, I think, that is an aim that Quine would have approved of. But of course, Quine did not like the way modal logic had developed. In fact, I tell people that one of the reasons why our book is in existence is because we were way, way, way on the other side of the world in New Zealand, and uh, we didn't know that Quine had told everybody. We didn't get the email that Quine had said modal logic is a no-no, so he went ahead and wrote a book about it. But, um, <coughs> but I want to look here, in this talk, I'm looking at Carnap's propositional modal logic. Th this particular um, enterprise is part of the research project that Adrian's talked about, the history of necessity going right back from ancient Greece and any other ancient traditions that we are able to, to come across. And I know Adrian is interested in the Indian uh, tradition. Going right up to the time of Quine, and the paper was begun in the end of 2010 when both Adrian and I had residential fellowships at the Royal Flemish Academy 
in Brussels. And our project was a project on Quine. We called the project Flight from Intention. But it became very, very clear to me very quickly that if we were going to look at Quine's views on modal logic, we really had to look at Carnap, because Carnap seemed to be uh, Quine's target in so many ways. Quine's objections are mostly about modal predicate logic, and Carnap did have a modal predicate logic, and I have another talk in which I look at the philosophical uh, implications of Quine's criticism. But in fact, Quine's, uh, Carnap's propositional modal logic has a number of interesting questions in itself. And furthermore, because it's a propositional logic, there are certain results that we can obtain in the propositional case that don't seem to be easily available in the predicate case, so that there are some important things we can learn. So I'm going to be talking to you firstly about Carnap's modal propositional logic, and secondly about uh, JCC McKinsey's development at the same time. Carnap's modal logic was occurs in two places. It occurs in an article, Modalities and Quantification, in the Journal of Symbolic Logic for 1946, and it also emerges in his book, Meaning and Necessity, published a year later. The difference between those two is pretty much uh, restricted to the predicate case. So for our purposes, it's the 1946 paper that I will be looking at. And then McKinsey, uh, in the previous year in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, had published another uh, attempt to derive modal logic, also without metaphysics. Both Carnap and McKinsey wanted to get modal logic without putting in anything that could be thought of as metaphysics. And in fact, the first quote from Carnap is, is that, look, the idea is quite a simple idea. It's that box alpha is true, if and only if alpha is valid. I'll write that, that one up. Box alpha is true if and only if alpha is valid. <clears throat> I'm now, my practice is now to use box when I mean logical necessity and L, which as you all know is the two-sided box, a box with only two sides is written like that. Also, there is another one called a hinged diamond. You take a diamond and you have a little hinge there, you turn it round and you get that. And that's, that, that's the hinged diamond, that's the two-sided box. And I use the L for uh, a restricted necessity, but I use the, the, the box now for logical necessity. Carnap used the letter N. I only met Carnap once, and that was in April of 1970, a few months before he died. I wasn't, at that stage, working on Carnap's modal logic, so I didn't have all the questions for him that I would have today. But I did ask him whether he knew of anyone who had used L for necessity prior to Robert Face, who wrote an article in 1950 and used L. And he said he couldn't remember. But I suspect the reason is this, that Face was using Lukashevich's Polish notation, and because N in Polish is the symbol for negation, uh, uh, Face couldn't use Carnap's symbol N, possibly noted that when Carnap said valid, he would say, is L true? And perhaps taking L true uh, was what led uh, Face to, to, to do that. But at any rate, this is, this is the, 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 the key idea. <clears throat> you can make that a little bit more precise. Carnap, in his paper, actually says, I'm not going to give you the details of, modal, of, of ordinary non-modal propositional logic, I'm, because we all know what that is, and I'm just assuming a standard account of it. So I have made it a little bit more explicit here, and I've said, let's look at a model. A model, in this case, is nothing more than an assignment of truth values to the propositional variables. We've got a propositional language based on variables, and a model is nothing more than an assignment of truth values to the variables. What's more important, of course, is to define the notion of the truth in a model. <coughs> 
And we want rules that, in, that go from an assignment of truth values to the variables to an assignment to all formulae. If it's a non-modal formula, and I am using, I'm using a propositional language whose primitive symbols are the variables and the fulsome, and whose one connective is the implication. Carnap uses conjunction, disjunction, and negation, and uh, would have definitions for the other operators. But it's convenient for a lot of purposes just to, to do that. And if you look at one and two on, I think, either the handout or the full paper, but that simply says that the falsum is always false in every model, and the uh, implication, the horseshoe or the hook, uh, behave as usual. The only interesting one now is when you have a modal formula. And if you look at three, it simply says box alpha is true in any model if alpha itself is true in every model, which is just this. So we have models which do nothing more than assign truth values. There's no possible worlds, there's no in anything else. This will give you at least S5, and I've given you the uh, axiomatization for S5. Notice, and this is a point that will be important in a moment, notice that S5 here is presented schematically, not in terms of formulae and a rule of uniform substitution for variables. That's a, that's a point that's going to turn out uh, to be important here and the standard axioms for S5 are listed uh, there. It's easy to show that, this, uh, that every model extended in that way, I'll say that a formula is Carnap valid, or I'll say, I'll say C valid, a formula is Carnap valid if it is true in every model, where a model does nothing more than assign truth values to vary, if it's true in every model, when the uh, truth relation is defined according to 1, 2, and 3 that are given there. And it's easy to show that any formula, any theorem of S5 is in fact C-valid, Carnap valid. However, S5 is not complete for Carnap validity, take the formula tilde box P. And I'm going to talk about the tilde box P phenomenon. Clearly, a propositional variable is not valid. That means that box P is false in any model. That means that tilde box P is true in every model. This means that it is C valid. And that, of course, is why we can't have a rule of uniform substitution for propositional variables because we certainly, one instance is going to be tilde box false implies false. And of course, since box false implies box false is true, this one doesn't hold. So although this is true, there are substitution instances. Although that is Carnap valid, there are substitution instances which are not uh, Carnap valid. There is no evidence from the 1946 article that Carnap appreciated that particular problem. He does have, when he goes on to first order logic, which I'm not going to be talking about today, when he goes on to first order logic, there are some suggestions that he would have accepted something like that. Now, there are two responses that you can make to the tilde box P problem. One is to say that it ought to be a theorem and that we must therefore give up the rule of uniform substitution. The other response is to say it had better not be a theorem, therefore we must do something else. We must adapt the semantics, we must, we must use some other tricks. If you adopt the first of those, uh, Carnap, although he doesn't mention the, the, the tilde box P problem, seems not to want to have that as a theorem of his modal logic, and I'll explain uh, why in a moment, and what he's, why he tries to do that. But if you did want that, 
it's fairly straightforward. You take S5, axiomatized by schemata, and you simply add, this is the thing I call S5 plus on the handout, we add a rule that says if you take a, a, a PC formula, that just means a formula of non-modal proposition logic, if you take a formula that is not a tautology, if alpha is not a PC tautology, then simply add tilde box alpha as a theorem. We don't need to worry about having that rule, having modal formulae in that rule, because there are enough principles in propositional S5 to allow you to reduce any formula in S5 to an equivalent formula in which there are no embedded modal operators. <clears throat> so that is sufficient, and you can prove completeness on that basis. But Carnap certainly describes the logic he wants as S5. Remember, this is the, the middle 1940s. In those days, the, which was the correct modal logic? Was, it, was, it, was something important. One of the things that the possible world's revolution in the late 50s and early 60s did was that it meant that we stopped asking that question. We no longer said which is the correct modal system. We said, well, if your accessibility relation has no properties, it's the system K. If it is reflexive, you have T. If it's tr transitive and reflexive, you have and so on. We just said, well, which is the correct modal logic? It depends on what properties you want for your accessibility relation. But in the days that we are talking about, the argument was still which is the correct modal logic, and Carnap was trying to defend S5 as the correct modal logic of logical necessity, and he was interested only in logical necessity because he wanted to get necessity out of, if you like, purely syntactical uh, notions of logic. He didn't want any metaphysics in, 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 to be in that. <clears throat> so, if you don't want to have the S5+, plus, what might you do? Carnap's approach, as far as I can, as far as I read that particular Carnap article, Carnap's ap approach was to follow Quine, who very early on, in an article in mind in 1934, had argued that logical truths are schematic. That's to say, it's the idea of a propositional variable is not appropriate. Quine would say something like, box, Wellington is the capital of New Zealand, is capital of New Zealand. And that, of course, would be false, because although Wellington is the capital of New Zealand, uh, if, they had, if they had not decided to, to move it from Auckland in 1965, Auckland would perhaps still have been the capital of New Zealand. So, um, and contrast that, of course, with Wellington is the capital of New Zealand implies Wellington is the capital of New Zealand, where that is indeed a tautology. So for Quine, logical truths were in fact schematic, and therefore even if tilde box P is Carnap valid, it's not appropriate as a theorem of your logic because it has invalid, it has substitution instances which are not Carnap valid. And that's what I call Q Quine Carnap validity. Quine Carnap validity simply says to be Quine Carnap valid is not just to be C valid yourself but it's for all of your substitution instances to be C-valid. And if you adopt Quine-Carnap validity, then you can prove that S5 is both sound and complete. And there is some suggestion that Carnap was working this way. Those of you who have the full paper, at the bottom of page 5, I've given you a quotation there, and Carnap says, we here make use of P, Q, etc. as auxiliary variables. That is to say, they are merely used following Quine for the description of certain forms of sentences. So it looks as though Carnap here is wanting to say that his logical truths, the theorems of his system, are the, the, the formulae that are Q, C valid, that is to say, that are valid no matter what substitutions you make for their propositional variables. And given that, you can. It's not trivial, actually. Um, 
I, uh, the, the, there are a couple of proofs here. Uh, Steve Thomason uh, produced one proof in the 1970s. Uh, in this paper, there is another proof which is closer to Carnap's style of proof based on reduction to conjunctive normal form. And it's the, the, the point is simply that where you have something which is not an S5 theorem, you have to somehow or other be able to substitute appropriately for its variables to make sure that it will turn out to be invalid even when you, uh, invalid when you, when you use Carnap's rule. And it's, it's not entirely trivial. Carnap makes some remarks that suggest that he thinks it's trivial, but in fact it isn't quite trivial. But nevertheless, it can be done. That, however, is not the only response you might have to the tilde box P problem. Another problem, another way is to look at a phenomenon, or at least to look at some other views of, of from Carnap. Now, when, the, when, we read, when we look at Carnap's meaning and necessity today, we usually look at the second edition. The book was originally published in 1947. A second edition came out in 1956. And in that edition, there are a number, about four or five articles written in the early 50s, which expand Carnap's views and are included as appendices. And among these is a, an article on meaning postulates. Carnap wanted meaning postulates to solve the problem of analyticity. Carnap is adamant that analyticity is important. If you look at his intellectual autobiography, he's, his constant theme is how, how Quine and Tarski disputed analyticity. And his constant theme is always how to answer uh, their criticisms. And this, this, is what, this is even as late as 1963 in the Schulp volume, The Philosophy of Rudolf Carnap. And one way of defending analyticity is to introduce what he calls meaning postulates. And one of his examples is, is, the, is the one philosophers always use. All bachelors are, uh, if Jack is a bachelor, then Jack is unmarried. That's one of Carnap's examples. And the way a meaning postulate is used is quite straightforward. It's that you are restricting your models to those which satisfy the meaning postulates. And he says, look, it's up to the theorist to decide what they are. Now, if then you took a meaning postulate, or supposing you took a set of meaning postulates and said, well, there's only one of them, and that is the, that is the variable P. Now, Carnap, in talking of meaning postulates, is talking in terms of formulae that can be formalized in first-order theories. I might say that Carnap never uses meaning postulates in trying to obtain his modal logic. So I'm, this is a little bit of reconstruction saying, here is a tool that Carnap could have used to solve the tilde box P problem. In the propositional case, a meaning postulate would just have to be a set of formulae of propositional logic. So let's suppose that P is, is one of them. If you then restrict yourself to all models that give P the value true, then, of course, in, in so far as you're talking about the restricted class of models that satisfy the meaning postulates, then we would be able to show that box P is true, and therefore that will defeat the tilde box P problem. And if we then go on to define validity as truth no matter what, how you, what collection of meaning postulates you have, in other words, you can take any arbitrary set of meaning postulates, and we are, a logical truth of the language is something that will remain true no matter how you choose your meaning postulates, then again we can get a completeness theorem for S5, at least in the propositional case. A lot of this goes to custard in the first order case, but in the, in the propositional case we can get, we can get a, a, a theorem, a completeness theorem there. So that is a the first solution, the Quine-Carnap validity, was the solution that I think Carnap used. The second solution is one which was available to him, but there is no evidence anywhere. In my, uh, in my knowledge, there is no evidence that I know of in Carnap's printed works to suggest that he wanted to use his notion of meaning postulates, which 
postdated the uh, meaning and necessity. Meaning and necessity was 1947. The article on meaning postulates was, I think, it's 1950, 1952. It's in your, it's in your bibliography uh, there. Uh, so that was somewhat later, and there's no evidence that Carnap used that solution. So that solution was not available to him. There is a third solution, which is historically interesting, and the third solution is to simply say, why not restrict the class of models? Why not say that for any restricted class of models, we can talk, we can evaluate, we can evaluate the... Um, the box as saying box alpha is true in any model if alpha itself is true in all models in this restricted class. Now a restricted class of models leads pretty well immediately to the ordinary possible world's math. Because if you, if you look at the work of Hintiger and Kanga and uh, Kripke here, we are they, 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 those, those authors, there was an exception in a Belgian logician named Arnold Bayer, but those authors all thought of the, what we now call possible worlds as models, and they talked about classes of models, restricted classes of models. They also, of course, appreciated that you can have relations between models. One model can be accessible from another model. And that, of course, is what led to other logics beside uh, besides uh, S5. But even if we're thinking of S5 and we don't want an accessibility relation between models, we can still say that when you're evaluating the box formula, you say box alpha is true if and only if A is true in a particular restricted class of models, and then the theorems will be those that no matter how, what, what class of models you produce, when you evaluate L with respect to that class of models. And since you can have a class of models which makes a propositional variable true all the time, in all members of the class, then of course again you will get S5. And of course that one, that particular definition will immediately generalize to the possible worlds one, because you can simply index your models, and instead of, and, and so that a, a class of models becomes an intentional model, because you index, you index the models in the class, and those, the indices are the possible worlds, so true in that model means true at that index, true in the supermodel at that index. There is even less evidence that Carnap would have understood, or at least would have appreciated, there's, there's less evidence that he did ever consider anything like that. I think it's highly plausible to think that he wouldn't have liked it. The reason that he wouldn't have liked it is because if you say, what is the right modal logic, it's going to say, well, it just depends on your class of models. And Carnap wanted a <coughs> definition of logical necessity, and he wanted his definition of logical necessity not to depend on the arbitrariness of a class of models. So my suspicion is that Carnap would not have been, at least at that time, temperamentally uh, suited to this, and probably he would have been even less suited to it when people started thinking of possible worlds as importantly metaphysical entities. So that I, I suspect, I suspect that that third way of solving the tilde box P problem is one which would not have been acceptable to Carnap, even though it's the one which a decade afterwards, because we're about the middle 50s, I mean Carnap and McKinsey's work was about a decade before the development of the, uh, of the, of the possible world semantics. It was probably the case that that particular uh, development would have, been, would have been not the sort of thing that Carnap would have been interested in. Okay, well, so much then for, for Carnap. One thing that the Quine-Carnap validity that I was talking about earlier and the meaning postulate validity are not going to do for you is give you a semantics for systems weaker than S5. The one that I just talked about, validity and classes of models, can of course do so if you introduce a relation between models, which is what Kinder did and what Hintiker did. Uh, Kripke in the 1959 paper where he does talk about classes of models is it produces a complete theorem just for S5. So it wasn't until the uh, mid early 60s till the 1963 paper that Kripke talked about uh, relations. Uh, 
And it was not until that paper that Kripke made the point that it doesn't really matter what the indices are, what the worlds are. Earlier, though he didn't have an accessibility relation, Arnold Bayer had made the point fairly explicitly that you should not identify worlds with, with models. But Bayer didn't have an accessibility relation. Bayer, incidentally, is the early person who produced the earliest Hink incompleteness theorem in modal logic, in modal predicate logic, in fact, and what he called quasi-completeness for second order logic, which is completeness in the, in the, in the relevant sense in which Hinken showed you can get a, a kind of completeness for second order logic. However, let's then move on because I want to look at the work of JCC McKinsey, which was almost contemporaneous. It was published a little bit earlier. McKinsey also, in his title, says this is a syntactical definition. Now, he didn't want any reference to other entities. Of course, you might say, how can it be a syntactical definition? Because we have a truth relation. So it's not, in a way, it's not completely semantic because it does involve a truth relation. But, in a, but that, that's the, the minimum. That's, apart from that, it's a, semantic, a syntactic definition. And if you look at McKinsey's description, he says that I take the position that to say a sentence is possible means that there exists a true sentence of the same form. Thus, for example, it could be said that the sentence lions are indigenous to Alaska is false, sorry, is possible because of the fact that the sentence lions are indigenous to Africa has the same form and is true. Now, McKinsey then goes on to make this a little bit more precise, and I will talk about McKinsey's way later on, but initially, let's take what McKinsey says and use it in the way the, the rule that I've labeled nine on the handout, and that is to say that it's that M alpha is true, M alpha is true, if and only if M gives alpha dash for alpha dash an instance of alpha. In other words, and here we are not moving from is true in M, if you like, M gives box alpha, if and only if M gives alpha dash. Now it's the same model now, but it's a different formula. So the idea is, so this would mean <coughs> that, now this of course is also subject to the tilde box P problem uh, because there is always an instance of this which is false. For example, box the false becomes false. That's an instance and that's, that's always false. So box, box P is always going to be false here because you can always find a substitution instance uh, which makes that false. Substitute the falsum. Substitute the falsum for P and uh, so that will mean that box P is always going to be false so until the box P is always going to be true. McKinsey is quite explicit here and uh, Makinson, uh, David Makinson in an article in the 1960s said that as far as he could tell he, McKinsey was the first person to realize the schematic nature of the, of the variables. McKinsey is quite explicit here that, we, that this wouldn't be an objection because uh, this, his, his theorems are to be the schemata. In fact, he, it's a little bit trickier than that. McKinsey says he doesn't have uh, propositional variables, but he thinks that those who do understand the propositional variables in such a way that the formulae are intended to be valid only if they're true no matter what. So in fact, um, uh, here he wants to say, well, for this to be valid, it's to be valid no matter what you put for P, which is in fact, effect what I call the quine carnap semantics. You're saying validity means truth for all instances of this particular uh, formula. He shows, McKinsey shows that you can get S4, that you can't get S5. Uh, I've given two formulae. I, I can show you don't get the Brouwerian axiom, which is sufficient. And it was known even to Lewis and Langford that the addition of the Brouwerian axiom to S4 gives you S5. 
Um, but in addition, you can get something stronger by this particular semantics. And the reason you can get something stronger is interesting. There is, there is an, a, a formula known as the McKinsey formula, which says diamond box, oops, box diamond alpha implies diamond box alpha. And that's equivalent also to diamond, diamond alpha implies box alpha. That's known as the McKinsey formula, and you can add that to S4. It's a, it's, you get a system that McKinsey called S4.1, but it's now normally called S4M because it's not S4.1 is not a subsystem of S4.2. And S4M has the semantics that your frames are reflexive and transitive, but every world can see an end point. That is, so every world can see a world that can see only itself. And if you think about the McKinsey uh, semantics here, that's plausible because one of the substitutions you can make for alpha is to substitute constants for the variables. And once you substitute constants for the variables, then there's no further place you can go. There's no truth and necessity coincide once you've substituted constants for the variables. So it's not surprising that, in fact, the system that you get by the, uh, the axiom, by the, by the rules I've, I've um, attributed to McKinsey, actually gives you this system, which is often called the McKinsey system. McKinsey um, mentions this system, but he does not claim that it's, uh, that his, 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 what he, his view is, is valid in this. And the reason is interesting. The reason is interesting because McKinsey does not actually set out his semantics for box the way I have. He sets out his semantics for box in a much more mathematical way by defining what he calls substitutions. Substitutions are the ways that you get one formula or another. And the substitution is a transformation of one formula to another which respects the structure of the formula. So if you look at, um, if you look at the S. Folsom down on, on, on page, the third page of the handout. The S. Folsom is the Folsom. The S of alpha implies beta is S alpha implies S beta. And the S of box alpha is box S alpha. And then you impose certain conditions on substitutions. For example, the leave alone substitution. Take a formula, do nothing with it. So that's, and, and that's, that, so that, that, and if the leave alone substitution is one, that means that your, your substitution satisfy a certain reflexive thing, that, that there's always going to be a substitution that does nothing. And similarly, we can get arguments for transitivity. If you take one thing and you substitute a formula for it, and then substitute something in that formula, you could have made it in one substitution. If you, anything you can get from a formula by two substitutions, you can get from a formula by one substitution. So you get transitivity. However, you don't always get symmetry. Because once you take a simple formula and substitute something more complex, there's no reason why you can get back. Now, if you said we're only going to allow substitution of variables for variables, and all var distinct variables must be substituted by other distinct variables, then you'll get back. So that what uh, Frank Drake proved uh, in the early 60s was that these various conditions on substitutions will get you respectively uh, T at S4 at S5, and so on, depending on what uh, additional uh, 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 requirements you add. The question is whether McKinsey saw or appreciated the difference between those two ways of doing it. This way doesn't involve any notion of a set of substitution. It simply defines it that way. When McKinsey gives the formal definition, he does use the notion in terms of a set of substitutions. But his motivational remarks seem to be more in touch with this. Uh, furthermore, if you have your set of substitutions, you actually, and you have truth in every set of substitutions, you don't need to worry quite so much. You'll, you'll get an automatic um, solution of the, of the tilt box problem. So the final uh, judgment about McKinsey is that he he does give you 
another definition which gives you S4. It's a definition that doesn't, that is a, is, is a way a purely syntactic definition, rather like Quine's. Um, it's not clear whether McKinsey appreciated the importance of the fact that there's an important difference between whether you, whether you want to give a definition here solely on the basis of the form of the formulae, or whether you want to give a definition which can vary depending on the, allow, the set of substitutions you allow. And that, I think, is, is, is an important, perhaps the most important difference here between Carnap and McKinsey on the one hand, or possibly McKinsey. McKinsey, it's, it's, it's less clear whether McKinsey... Where, where they wanted to give, they wanted to reduce the idea of logical necessity to something that they understood. But of course, the way modal logic developed and the way that Carnap's use of meaning postulates, that, that solution can, is, is again a solution that's it's saying to be valid, you have to be true no matter how you choose your meaning postulates, which is getting towards the idea of truth with respect to a selected subset of models. Uh, and McKinsey's subset of substitution, so that although I don't believe that they entirely appreciated this difference, you can see the beginnings of the use of arbitrary collections of models, which only became explicit about a decade later and led to the semantics that we know and love today. And that's it. <clears throat> Thanks to Professor um, <clears throat> for this very interesting talk. Now it is open for questions and discussions. Yes. So, so um, you mentioned also meaning postulates as a, another solution for, mm. but um, there are not many traces of that in Karnapur. Did you say that? What I said was that Carnap has an article on meaning postulates, but I know of nothing whatsoever in his published writing that suggests using that in his modal logic. So the answer, the answer is that it's not so much there are not many traces as far as I know. I haven't found anything. So the, the, so the, the, the solutions that I was giving was first, I thought, the solution that he had in mind. Second, a solution that was available to him, even though there's no evidence that he had in mind. And third, a solution that I suspect he would have been less comfortable with. So that was yeah. the sort of the three levels of the, of, of the but, solution. But perhaps, I mean, his reluctance, perhaps, I don't know if he was reluctant, but his, the fact that he didn't use the mini postulate solution was very much, probably had to do with the fact that that would have implied him recognizing the distinction between analytic and synthetic, oh, yes. to which Quine was uh, sure, very I much know, I know, and that's why in the, uh, that's why in other work, uh, I've had to go through a large amount of, Car I mean, Carnap is explicit, defending, and defending the notion of analyticity as a genuine empirical notion against Quine. At some point he says, look, linguists are all the time telling us whether sentences are or not analytic. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little bit more, Carnap is much more polite than I am, but Quine is telling us they can't do this, but they manifestly do do this. And, and I, I'd rather, I would rather follow the linguists who do something than Quine, who says they can't do what they manifestly do do. So, so um, the, the, the reason why I'm interested in the meaning postulates and why I want to say this is available to Carnap is that it does go very, it does require, you're quite right, in order to use meaning postulates in modal logic, you have to show not merely that the theorist is accepting it as true. There might be all sorts of reasons for saying, I'm not going to be interested in models in which these things are false. But for, for, for it to give you a modal logic, you have to say, and furthermore, I am accepting as my meaning postulates only those things which are analytic. So Carnap must defend the fact that analyticity is an empirical fact about language use. And in my view, he does do this. So you're quite right that that particular option, to argue that that is available for him, you have to supplement what I said this morning with the evidence from Carnap 
that he not just accepted analyticity, but continually wanted to defend that. He, he thought of that as the biggest... I mean, it wasn't as though he said, well, look, I used to have analyticity and Quine disagrees. It was that for Carnap, as far as I can tell, Carnap was always conscious of the fact that the difference between him and, and Quine was absolutely crucial and vital and absolutely important. So, yes, you're quite right. You've got to supplement it to make it plausible for Carnap. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. <clears throat> McKinsey was a colleague of Tarski. Yeah, he, so he was, I, I was. I'm wondering what were the views of Tarski on. Well, um, it is, it's interesting. I mean, because Tarski. I mean, one of the things. Um, one story I heard was this: was that McKinsey and Tarski had produced a modal logic which actually modeled S4. And I've heard a story from my colleague Rob Goldblatt, who heard Kripke had said, I think that Kripke had mentioned this to Tarski, that wasn't there a connection between their algebras and modal logic. And Tarski said he didn't see it. So my suspicion is that McKinsey collaborated as a mathematician with Tarski, but I don't know. I mean, McKinsey certainly wanted to produce, wanted to give a justification, turned out to be, as he thought, for S4. He wanted a justification which was syntactical in the sense that the only semantic notion was the truth of a, of a, of a variable. There was, no, there was no other semantics in it. And McKinsey was fairly clear there. So I think there was this sort of anti-metaphysical desire, both on the part of McKinsey and of Carnap. And it looks as though uh, well, McKinsey doesn't say much about analyticity here. I mean, there's no, I mean, for McKinsey, these logical truths were ones where the substitution instance didn't change the logical operators. They only, uh, they were only instances uh, of the, of the, of, of the variables. So McKinsey was probably looking at a logic the, 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 the question of analyticity didn't arise in McKinsey's case, so there wouldn't be that objection from Tarski. But the, the only thing I can say is in telling that story is it looks as though uh, at least, I mean, I've got it third hand. I've got it from Kripke telling Goldblatt telling me uh, that in fact Tarski just said he didn't see any connection between the algebraic work and the modal logic. So, and McKinsey, now, McKinsey, as far as I recall, was a mathematician rather than a philosopher, though he, he had some uh, philosophical interests. I mean, he was, uh, he was the one who got Ruth Marcus interested in, in modal logic. So um, there, was, there was not an antipathy to modal logic on his part, but um, the connection with... with um, I mean, it is interesting that Tarski thought that that particular paper which looks like an algebraic semantics phrase four, was not seen by Tarski as having anything to do with modal logic. <laughs> yes. Uh, any other question? So, if there is uh, no other question, let's give a big hand to Professor Kressman. Thank you.